and it was focused on the subject of the machine and robots in the context of the um, digital projects and architecture. Um, shortly to uh, the structure of my presentation, I'm going to briefly present a bit the theoretical background of the concept of machine craft. Um, and then I'm going to move on to presenting to you a robotics project which was developed at the Vienna Institute in Barcelona. So as we've seen uh, before in all the other presentations, today we face a new context. We have um, um, a big amount of digital tools, uh, all of them of different types, and we use them to develop um, different specific types of digital processes. Um, Romance and Kohler, whom you surely know, have addressed this problem and um, they developed a concept which is called digital materiality. And in this context, they are saying that the paradigm shift in the production conditions of architecture is actually the most relevant shift uh, we, we face today in our um, discipline. So, um, in terms of software packages, architects take full advantage of the potential of the digital context. Um, we are able to develop customized uh, scripts by using uh, programming, um, our programming skills um, using open source platforms uh, such as Grasshopper, programming languages, Rhino script, Arduino processing to develop um, plugins and scripts which are um, um, correspond to the specific demands of our projects. But when it comes to the real physical digital tools uh, we have and which we Use, we just use the ones which are on the market without trying to adapt to them to the needs of architecture. And this is, um, I believe, a lost potential. And this is the point where I developed the concept of machine craft. So, machine craft, as the word says, it's composed out of two words uh, the element of the machine and the element of the craft. Um, already, Vitruvius, in his 10 books of architecture, was mentioning that. Um, the discipline of architecture is made out of three main components. The building discipline itself, then the development of sandbox, okay, we don't have this today anymore, and then uh, mechanics. With mechanics, he meant the development of mechanical tools which can facilitate the building of, or the construction of the buildings. So, um, in this context, um, the concept of machine craft was developed because um, I believe that um, the potential of architects to develop machines or their own physical tools in terms of also digital tools um, has been neglected and the best way to address this uh, problem or this potential would be by uh, using uh, robots so that we can reactivate this concept of craftsmanship because cra craftsmanship as we heard before it's a complex strategy of using both material um, your design ideas but also making use of the tools and developing your own tools so machine craft tries to combine these three main elements the machine the digital and the manual and um, this isn't just a new concept, but it's, um, it's a concept which you can find throughout um, architectural history. So starting with people who already argued for um, architects developing their own machines, um, if we move further on uh, to the uh, middle part of the Renaissance, there we can find Brunelleschi, the architect who developed the, um, uh, the dome of the, so the cupola of the Florentine dome. And in order to be able to do so, he had to span over 44 meters. Um, across history, the only two similar buildings spanning this, um, this amount of meters uh, were the Pantheon in Rome and the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, with a uh, spanning only 32 meters. So in order to be able to actually build this cupola, he had to develop a new type of building strategy in terms of also organizing the construction site um, to develop a uh, sort of a new type of material system. But most importantly for uh, my case, he had to develop a complete set of uh, machines. So these machines were conditioning um, 
the buildability of this project. So the architect being educated in machine development can actually, uh, this can actually lead to uh, big non-standard shapes uh, which weren't present before. Here you can see some sketches of the machines, uh, not done by Pinaleski himself, as there are um, the sketches of drones that do not exist, but uh, done by um, Da Vinci. Uh, then if we move across uh, history and we go to the Industrial uh, Revolution, as we heard it before, um, again, the, the subject of transformation <coughs> was central, of, uh, although it was not conducted by architects, but mainly by um, engineers. But if we look at the Crystal Palace in uh, London and the architect and engineer jo uh, Joseph Paxton, he again makes a very strong case for machine craft. Uh, he was able to construct the Crystal Palace as, as it was by using the new technologies which were at that point on the market, but he also additionally developed his own machines for the specific need of the construction site of the Crystal Palace. Um, uh, after the industrialization, the School of Architecture and the School of Engineering um, separated from each other um, quite strongly. Uh, for this uh, reason, architects weren't so much involved anymore in machine development itself, so that in our age, if we look at architecture, we do use uh, Kuka robots or other type or 3D printers or other type of digital tools, but um, the problem with this is we um, don't implement them and adapt them to the needs of architecture, but we just take them as they are and try to make use of them, whether it makes sense or not. So um, in this context, the, um, the project of many builders at the Viac Institute uh, was developed. Uh, we tried to make a case for not just looking for technologies which are on the market and trying to implement them for architecture, but actually to look at existing technologies and to develop our own new tools and new technology in order to sustain a construction strategy which we develop and which we believe uh, would make more sense for existing um, for the organization of uh, existing construction sites than um, just making um, use of, of a robot, of a traditional robot. So uh, we had a look at automation um, um, on the construction side. Of course, you can find um, a huge amount of different examples. Um, here you will find just a few, the, the ones which I consider representative. So in Japan, in the uh, mid-80s, they were quite strong on um, automizing the construction side. You can see this big canopy uh, system. It is a bottom-up construction system. You can see this huge platform. It's being moved from level to level. It contains different types of uh, actually robots. So this was in the 80s. So if we consider these robots aren't that new in terms of architecture as we believe nowadays. Um, and it would build level for level for level and being pushed up. Um, as you can see, the whole system is quite huge. It takes a lot of um, place around the building. So it, it's actually not usable and it doesn't make sense for every type of construction site. Here it does. It, it is a tower and in the surroundings do have a place to, to um, set up this whole system. But in other cases, uh, maybe this um, wouldn't take place. Um, a different example, um, in our times, Kuka robots, for instance, at the ETH in Zurich, they are just being used, um, they are taken from the um, car industry and just being used in terms of architecture for doing a repetitive tasks which, as humans, we could more or less do, but it would be quite time intensive. But um, there is actually no revolutionary use or no implementation or adaptation to the needs of architecture or specific needs of architecture as it could be. So um, for our robotics project, we had a look at, the, at industrial robots, but also at 3D printers. And for 3D printers, we found it quite interesting that the strategy of um, material deposition could be used in an efficient way for architecture in terms of building non-standard geometries and um, also in terms of not, not having to use a 
supportive structure while printing curved elements. So we tried to develop a combination of these two technologies which resulted in a sort of hybrid. Um, another uh, quite important aspect for us was the aspect of the size of the construction. So uh, if we look at the construction tools on the construction site, they are quite uh, huge. They represent a danger for the people work for the workers. Um, they are not flexible and um, not at all um, Lightweight. So we tried to address this problem by, by uh, wanting to design and develop a, um, a small robotic system which should be flexible, mobile and lightweight so that uh, there would be no danger for the people working actually on site and that you could have the opportunity of placing and replacing by hand um, the robots. But uh, before actually developing um, the robotic technology, we started with modular processes because it wasn't quite clear what type of material we are going to use for 3D printing. Um, but again, before starting with the material, we need um, some sort of mechanism for extruding the material and a type of nozzle so that you can control the material position of the layer. So on the left hand side, you can see the first extruder which will be developed and on the right hand side different types of nozzles. Uh, we did, we started by doing here in, in the background, you can see myself and the quite fancy extruder we constructed and um, in the top front um, the nozzle. Um, as you can see, the material experiments weren't successful at all. What I should have mentioned before, uh, we started using uh, by experimenting with two component resin systems, uh, which we combined with marble powder. So, um, in order to achieve that, this uh, results at the end of the project, we had to look at the different material parameters uh, and to understand how the material works. So, to understand the ratio between the two different resin components to understand how much marble powder to add in order to make, to make it um, more cost efficient and um, also, also more stable to understand how the viscosity of the material functions during the uh, extrusion and also to have a look at the extrusion rates and the extrusion speed uh, while depositing the material. So after doing a um, whole bunch of um, different types of experiments in the lower side, we even tried to add um, glass fiber, but uh, we had strong, like quite big problems uh, during the extrusion process, um, and also we didn't uh, find a way to um, control the way that the glass fiber was deposited and the orientation of the glass fiber so that it would make sense um, to actually increase the stability that we decided to just use um, the two component resin system and marble powder. Um, at the end of our material experiments, we had this quite nice results. Uh, we placed this nozzle um, um, at the end of a uh, robot and um, actually managed to have quite perfect results as you can see here. So after finishing with the material um, experiments, we went back to looking at the uh, printing strategy. So, as I said before, we're quite fascinated by the 3D printing technology, um, but uh, we try to adapt it for a specific need. We all know that 3D printers are printing layer after layer on top of each layer, but it, uh, it's, not a quite, it's not a continuous uh, process in itself, because it finishes one layer, then it moves up, it deposits the next layer. So, also on a conceptual level, we find found it much more interesting to say that we actually do have a continuous printing uh, and depositing strategy so that we decided to print um, uh, like a spiral so that the printing process isn't interrupted and also by doing tests we found out that the structural stability is higher if you print with a spiral. Uh, we had a look at the uh, construction phases um, that in general terms, construction phases, and we identified uh, three main phases for architecture. You would usually start by building the foundation, then you move on with building the walls, and then somewhere in between you also need reinforcement. 
So for this three phases, we decided to develop a three separate robots which, um, which could uh, fulfill the needs of these phases. So the phase robot which we um, designed and built um, is the foundation robot. Um, it is responsible for building the first five to 15 layers um, of the shape you are designing. Um, here at the front, you can see it has um, a sensor. So before starting to actually build, you have to um, make marks on the ground um, for the footprint of the building so it can follow um, it can follow the shape and it knows where to deposit material as we decided not to work with the global positioning system as this would have taken a lot of um, design and scripting energy which we rather invested in developing the robots themselves. You can see our proto structure with, which we printed with this robot. Um, you can see the tiny robot um, in the center of the platform, how it is printing the foundation layers. It is um, connected to industrial extruder as we needed huge amounts of material and we couldn't use any more the small extruders uh, we designed for ourselves uh, in the lab. Moving on to the second phase, this is the grip robot uh, responsible for actually printing the whole structure. Um, it is being placed manually on top of the uh, previously printed um, foundation layers and it moves, it follows the spiral movable, uh, uh, movement round and round until the shape is uh, finished. You can see some images from the same photo structure. So it is again connected to the industrial extruder where it gets the material from. Uh, it moves around. Here you can see this um, small element, this bar, which is being used um, to um, um, in just in case that there are some printing errors or that the material isn't evenly distributed, it will flatten the material out so that the movement can continue uh, quite uh, smoothly. You can see um, again a close-up of this robot here with the small rows it, um, it uses to move along the structure and to push itself up. Um, as we printed in Barcelona in a spring and it was quite humid and the resin system needs um, a bit of time to actually um, to harden, we also decided to um, build in these two heating elements just in case it would start to rain or because of the higher humidity uh, during springtime so that the separate layers would uh, pass in time for when the robot would get around again. And um, the last phase, of course, the reinforcement phase, this is the vacuum robot. It is capable of, uh, you can place it on the structure by creating a vacuum between himself and the surface of this protostructure. It can just move up and down and uh, depositing um, the reinforcement layers. And these are some, um, this, are, this is the final slide. Um, here you can see the extruder working with the climber robot, how it is following the robot around the platform and um, um, depositing the material. So um, I believe that this project shows quite nicely how architects have nowadays the possibility to get involved uh, in the development of design, of course, development of material systems, but also in developing their own physical tools for accomplishing or for designing new uh, fabrication or construction strategies which they see fit for their, their specific